So again, Paul says, Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth. So the idea is with one thought or one perspective and also one message, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now Paul has been talking about loving one another. He spends the better portion of two and a half chapters talking about loving one another. And then he is going to go on and he's going to speak about some other one another statements. But there's a pause here in chapter 15, verses 5 and 6, because he offers up these two verses. It isn't a command, though it's something that should happen. And it's not just an exhortation, though it's something we should want. It isn't even just a promise, though it is something we should claim. What he says is a prayer request. He offers up a prayer request to God on behalf of the church. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is something we're a part of, but if you notice what he's saying, it's something God gives. It's something that God has to do. We might try really hard to be unified. We might try really hard to be connected with one another. But we're up against some things that are really difficult to do that. And so the idea of unity, the idea of like-mindedness, is not something that we can just make happen on our own. We need God's power. We need God to do the work. Notice again what it says there in verses 5 and 6. Now may the God of patience, meaning he's the God of all patience. If we're going to be united, we're going to need patience, right? Now may the God of patience and comfort, meaning this, there are times we might try to bond with someone and it just doesn't work. There might be a relationship that we're struggling to maintain and it seems like it's falling apart and we might even be hurt by that. We need comfort. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus. Meaning this, Jesus is the one we bond on. We just sang the song, you know, thank you Jesus for saving me. It doesn't matter what our background is, where we've been from, or how different we are. The bottom line is this, Jesus should be the thing that binds us all together. Because all of us were sinners and all of us have been set free from our sin by what Jesus did in the cross at Calvary. Amen? Okay, so... Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth, that's a lot of oneness there, one mind and one mouth, meaning this, that we would have the same perspective on the things that matter and that we would have the same message so we don't have a mixed message. We're not talking about love and unity and grace and mercy and then breaking down our brother. We're not speaking words that are blessings and also cursing out of the same mouth. We want to have a clear message. Kind of like what they lacked there in Ezra when God was doing a work of rebuilding in Ezra chapter 3. And as they were rebuilding the temple, remember they hadn't had a temple for years. They'd been gone for 70 years. And as they were rebuilding the temple, there was rejoicing Because the temple was a picture of worship. So in other words, they were reestablishing their relationship with God. They were reconnecting with the Holy One of Israel. And as they were seeing that God was doing something new, there was a restoration process that was taking place. Those people who were young, who'd never experienced God, they were rejoicing. And they were proclaiming that God is good and his mercy endures forever. Do you remember that? They're chanting it. The Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. The Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. They're quoting Psalm 136 as God is showing up and showing himself strong on their behalf. But while they're doing that, rejoicing that there's now going to be a temple, rejoicing that that restoration process has started, the scripture goes on to say, but then the old men, the ones that had remembered the temple, so they were old, they, they had been They're in Babylon for 70 years. So some of them might have been 90 years old, maybe 100 years old. Then the old men, the ones that remembered the temple that once stood, when they looked at the foundation for the new temple, they thought, this is nothing. This is nothing. As if to say, in my day, we used to walk uphill both ways in the snow. 
<laughs> in my day, we didn't have toys. We made toys. We made toys out of our fingers and dirt and rocks. In my day, we had to make fun. It wasn't given to us. You know, that type of thing, that crotchety type of sense. As they looked out and they saw that, that the temple foundation was small, it wasn't impressive like the previous one, they remembered the former glory, they wept. And then the passage goes on to say this, and so those that were rejoicing still rejoiced, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his mercy endures forever. Those that complained and were whining were still complaining and whining, and they were loud. And so because this group here was rejoicing and this group was crying, there was just simply a loud sound to those on the outside. So people outside of the camp of Israel just thought, it's noise. We don't want that. The Bible tells us that if we speak with the tongues of angels and the tongues of men, meaning we speak eloquently and we also speak supernaturally, but we don't have love, then we're just noise. We're a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. We don't want that. And that's what this is saying here in Romans 15, that with one mind and one mouth, with a clear sound, with a clear message, we glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, meaning we can say as a group, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His mercy endures forever, regardless of what's going on in our life, if we're saved. If we know Jesus Christ, if we've been forgiven of our sins, if we've been made right with God, we can say, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Amen? Because he is. He's good. He's been good towards us. He's blessed us with forgiveness of sins. He's blessed us with salvation. And now he's made us one because everyone in this room, though we may have different backgrounds, we may come from different families, we have different perspectives, different ways of thinking, different opinions. The bottom line is this. If we are Christians, we have been forgiven of our sin the same way. We've been made new by the same God. And so we have the same salvation. And because we have the same salvation, we have the same destiny. We're going to be in heaven together for all eternity. And that's going to be amazing. So now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth Glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is a call here, a desire, a prayer request for unity. And there's three things we need to know about Christian unity here in verses five and six. Number one, unity isn't natural, meaning it doesn't just happen. Unity isn't natural. Notice, now may the God of patience and comfort grant you. We need God involved. It's not something that just happens naturally. It's not something we can do on our own. We need God involved in it. Again, unity isn't natural. We are naturally different. We're naturally divided. Unity isn't natural. Years ago, I was in Rosarito, Mexico, and I walked into a church. I was there on a mission trip, and um, we wanted to go fellowship on Sunday morning, and we saw Calvary Chapel, Rosarito. And so we walked inside the church. We were greeted in the parking lot very well. As we walked in, <clears throat> we were greeted inside, and we noticed there was something very interesting about that church. It wasn't just that we were greeted because people had to greet us, like they had to check off a box because that was their job. Everybody was greeting. We were greeted in the parking lot. We were greeted at the door. We were greeted as we sat down. And as we sat down, there were people that came up to us, not recognizing us, that greeted us. And we realized this place is really friendly. They have an atmosphere of greeting. And I loved it. I thought, this is awesome. Then the worship started. And when the worship started, I thought, it's pretty amazing. When the worship started, the music was good. They were good uh, musicians, but they were gifted. And as the words came up, I noticed they were in English, which was a little uncommon in Mexico. And so it was in English, and we were singing the first verse. And then the second verse, the words were in Spanish. And everybody was singing in Spanish. And then the third verse was in English. And the fourth verse was in Spanish. And it went back and forth. And in the the, co the chorus, it was both English and Spanish, and the English speakers were singing English, Spanish speakers singing Spanish, but they're singing the same melody. And it was just incredible. It was beautiful. I thought, this is amazing. It was like a foretaste of heaven. 
And then right after worship was a brief greeting time, and that was wonderful. And then the message came, and it was a great message. Pastor Mike, the pastor down there in Rosarito, gave a great message. But he did something different. I'd never seen anybody do before when they're speaking with a translator. I speak oftentimes with a translator all over the world, but I usually will speak large chunks, and then I let them edit me. So I'll speak this amount, and then they basically pick the most important parts, and then they say, he says, love one another. You know, well, I said more than that. I said a lot, and there was a really funny illustration in there too. And they're like, that, not important. Boom. So I say this, they give this. Not so with Mike and the translator. Mike was a pastor. The translator was a pastor. And as Mike would share, he would share maybe five or seven or eight words. And as he would share those words, he'd pause, and he'd go like this. And he'd stop, and then he would hold it like this, and the translator would say those five, seven, or eight words, the, the same words in Spanish, and then he'd go. <laughs> and then Mike would be like, blah, 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 and, and then the translator goes, blah, 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 and then and it was back and forth the whole message. Honestly, it wasn't distracting to me. I was blessed by it after about maybe three or four minutes. When it ended, I walked out saying to the person I was with, that was incredible. It was amazing. And it felt like a foretaste of heaven. As you see two different groups of people there in that church of different backgrounds, expats, Americans, Mexicans, in the same church getting ministered together at the same time. I thought it's wonderful. And as I was walking out, I noticed that there was a person that was next to us who also was from the United States, a different group of people. And they said to the other person, man, that was distracting. And I thought, look, it doesn't matter how hard you try. It doesn't matter what you do. There's no way that we're ever going to make perfect unity here on earth with each other. We can't do it. It's God's work. It's something he does. But he gives us examples of it. He gives us sneak peeks. He gives us foretastes, calling us to always be pursuing unity. Notice Revelation 5. Turn there with me, please. Revelation chapter 5. I want to point out something to you that's really interesting. Revelation 5, looking at verse 9. Revelation 5, in the first part there, gives us a sneak peek into heaven. And we see the unity that we're talking about. It's not natural. It's supernatural. And it's something God has to do for us to experience unity. Notice Revelation 5, verse 9. It says this. They sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And notice again, they sang a new song. Well, who is it? It's believers in heaven. Whether it's by death or by rapture, it's believers in heaven all together. It's us here in this room who know the Lord. Up there, singing a new song. You're saying, wait a second, I don't sing. I'd love to sing. I can't sing. I sing off key. Sounds like a dying duck. <laughs> Listen, not in heaven. Not in heaven. In heaven, you'll sing perfectly. In heaven, we'll all sing perfectly. We'll all be on key. They sang a new song. What's the song? I don't know. I know, but it's not. It's not rap. It's not polka. It's not smooth jazz. Listen, it's not rock. It's not blues. It's not easy listening. It's not hymns. It's a new song. It's a new song that somehow would be penned by the God who is so creative, he made all of you. He made all of creation. And the God who was so creative to make all those things, he inspired all those other things. What? He inspired rap? Yeah. He inspired polka? Yeah. yeah. Even Wayne Newton? Yeah. He inspired all of those things. He's a creative God who makes people in his image. He is incredibly creative. And that new song, whatever it is, it's going to be amazing. And we're going to sing it together in heaven. Notice what it says there. It says that he has redeemed us to God by his blood out of every tribe, tongue, and people, and nation. 
meaning every tribe, tongue, people, and nation is represented there, and they're all one, but that's heaven, and that's something God does. Once in a while, people try to make heaven on earth. They try to put people together. Let's have you know, joint worship services, and I get that. The reason why they want to do that type of thing is because they see that in many places there's a lot of division. The world sees that too. The world sees that in many places when it comes to the Christian religion that there is, in fact, a lot of division. It reminds me of a story that was written a long time ago. It's called The Guy on a Bridge by a man named Emo Phillips. Some of you know that name. He said this, once I was in San Francisco walking along the Golden Gate Bridge and I saw a guy who was about to jump and I said, don't do it. He said, why not? Nobody loves me. And I said, God loves you. Do you believe in God? And he said, yes. I said, me too. Are you a Christian or a Jew? He said, a Christian. I said, me too. Protestant or Catholic? He said, Protestant. I said, me too. What denomination? He said, Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? He said, Northern Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist? I said, me too. Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist or Northern Conservative Reformed Baptist? He said, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region? or Northern Conservative Baptist Eastern Region. He said, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region. <laughs> Me too. Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879, or Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. He said, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. I said, die, heretic. <laughs> Listen, that bit was written a long time ago, back in 1985. And I read recently that it just got voted the number one joke on religion. Think about that for a second. The world's view is that that's the number one joke on religion. Why is that funny to them? because there's truth in it. Because there's all sorts of ways that people divide. There's all sorts of things that they find out about someone they don't like and they don't wanna be with them. They might not push them off a bridge, but would they help them up? Would they love one another? We're called to something more and that something is not something we can do on our own. So when people try to gather together and say, well, why do we have this group and that group? Why do we have that denomination, that denomination? Why do we have all these different churches? I'm not grieved by that. We have different churches for the most part because people are different. And every church has a different personality, has a different style. Some people like high church. They like liturgies. I grew up in that. It's not my thing. But it was my parents' thing for a long time. Some like low church, more casual. That's my thing. Some have services that are longer than others. Some have services that are half hour. That's not our thing. Some have services that are four hours. That's not our thing. We're somewhere in between. Hour and a half seems good. Okay. Different churches have different things, different styles, different methods, because they minister to different people. And the effort that we have in human flesh to try to connect each other and say, well, let's just be one church. Let's gather together and have a common Easter service or let's gather together and have a bunch of churches that have worship at the park. Listen, I found it happen over and over again, time and time again. As honest and real as the desire is to do something good, we end up magnifying our differences more than our similarities. We demonstrate unity by praying for one another and recognizing we are part of this big thing called the church of God. Christians all over the world, they go to different churches. And we recognize we're going to see them in heaven. We're going to worship the Lord together in heaven. Amen? But we can have differences here on earth. And we might have different churches. Some are Reformed, right? So they call themselves Calvinist. Some are Armenian, right? They have a different view. Some are in between. They call themselves Calmanian. I don't know. 
Some are Baptist, some are Pentecostal, some are Bapticostal. They're different things. There's different versions. There's different mindsets. And there's different reasons why people go to the church they go to. The important part is that we recognize that we're a part of the church Jesus started. That is, we're a part of the universal church of God, okay? the body of Christ. And that means we're going to heaven. Amen? And now we find a local church like this church, the church particular, and we plug in and we get involved and we bloom where we're planted, recognizing this is our family. There's a difference between the two. They're not the same. Just like, for example, there's a difference in your family. We can have unity, all of us together, but we represent many different families. Okay? I didn't go to dinner at your house last night. Why? Because you didn't invite me. Okay? I wasn't invited in your family time. You had family time. You slept in your bed. You had your own room. You have a lock in the door. That doesn't mean that you are divisive. That just means you have boundaries, okay? The same thing exists in churches. Churches that are local are families. And so we have a family here. There's a family down the street there. There's another family over there. There's another family over there. And one day when we die, we go to heaven and are perfected. There'll be no differences. We'll just be one in heaven, amen? Until then, we pursue unity of heart and unity of message. Secondly, unity isn't easy. That's not an easy thing. Turn your Bibles again over to Ephesians 4. Notice what it says. Ephesians 4, verse 1. It says here, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you or urge you to walk worthy of your calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now you can read that, and it's a beautiful passage. It sounds like a refrigerator verse where you can put on your refrigerator and encourage people, but this is a tough challenge. Notice again what it's saying. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. So first off, he says, I beseech you. I urge you, which means this. I am calling you to do something you're not doing. I'm calling you to do something you may not understand. I'm calling you to do something that's hard. It's not an easy thing. I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling in which you were called. That may not sound hard to you. How about this? With all lowliness. Okay, well, I get that. Just be humble. That's not what it means. Lowliness means here humiliation of mind. You might call it the annihilation of your ego. Humiliation of mind. It's the same word, by the way, used in Philippians chapter 2, verse 2, when we're called to be like-minded towards one another with lowliness of mind. That word is borrowed from secular Greek, and Paul uses a word that anybody back in their day understood what it meant. Lowliness of mind was a word that was used in their writings to describe the town idiot, to describe the guy that was just a fool, that had slobber all over his tunic. That guy. The guy that people didn't think highly of. So in other words, what it's saying is, think yourself to be nothing. That's what we need to do. With all lowliness, notice, and gentleness, which means meekness, power under control. Not weakness, meekness. So think yourself to be nothing. Now, have self-control. With long-suffering, meaning long-tempered, a long fuse, long-suffering, bear with one another. That word there means put up with one another. So in other words, with lowliness of mind, annihilation of your ego, viewing yourself as nothing, with self-control and a long fuse, put up with one another. Because there are some times you're going to need a long fuse, there's sometimes you're going to need self-control. There's sometimes that you're going to need to think nothing of yourself to be able to be with some other people. That's what we need to do. That's a tough thing. Not easy. So unity, it isn't natural, but also it isn't easy. It's something that we're called to endeavor to do, which means that we have to make it a priority to try hard to be unified. So we need to be intentional 
in unity. Why? Because we have disagreements and because, sadly, we can have divisions. We need to try hard because disagreements will happen. There's trouble. You get two people together, you get a problem. And sometimes those disagreements can build into divisions. And this happens all throughout church history. And it's sad to say that Christians oftentimes can be very petty about really silly things. Somewhere in Texas, I don't remember where it is, there's a place there that has first community church of such and such, second community church of such and such, third community church of such and such, meaning three churches that all have the same name except for first, second, third. Okay. What happened was years ago, back in the 20s or 30s, they were actually one church and they had a potluck and someone passed mashed potatoes to one of the elders and then they served another elder mashed potatoes and it was not enough compared to the first elder. So someone had mashed potatoes that were this much and someone had mashed potatoes that were that much. And because of a small amount of mashed potatoes, they felt like the person that was serving was trying to make a message. They were trying to make a statement. And so they got mad and they said something to someone else and someone else said something to someone else and eventually there became a faction that supported this elder and there was another faction that supported this elder and that grew and all of a sudden families decided to bind, bind themselves with this guy and other families bound themselves to this guy and all of a sudden this group was talking bad about this group of people over what? Mashed potatoes? That's insane. And so now you fast forward decades and there's first community church of such and such, second community church of such and such, and third community church of such and such. And by the way, none of them want to have potlucks and serve mashed potatoes, right? You're afraid of what's going to happen. I think maybe they need to talk about what the word community means. It means common. It means one. It doesn't make any sense for there to be three churches called the first community church, the second community church, and the third community church. These are people who allow their disagreements to become divisions. There's always going to be disagreements. And sadly, there's probably going to be divisions. But here's the principle for you and I. Don't be a part of the problem. You, not, you won't be able to solve every disagreement you may not be able to stop every division, but you don't have to ever be a part of it. Romans 12, verse 18 says, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. And what that means is it's not always possible, but at least as it pertains to you, live peaceably. Do your part. Don't be a part of all the junk. So unity, it isn't natural, it isn't easy, and lastly, it isn't impossible. Again, it isn't impossible. Notice verse 5 again. Romans 15, verse 5, it says, Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, unity isn't natural. That's why you have to ask God for it. It's not easy. That's why you need his help. You can't do it on your own. But it isn't impossible. It's something that God can do in us, and it's something that God can also do through us. Now, before we go on, let me just say this. Unity doesn't mean we have to agree on everything. Unity can exist where we have uh, disagreements about certain things that are non-essentials, and it's important for us to know that there needs to be diversity because I believe God is honored by there being diversity, like I mentioned earlier. Unity has diversity with civility. We can be civil and have different perspectives. Donald Gray Barnhouse, the great preacher, once said it this way, the Bible says we are brothers and sisters in Christ, but it never says that we are identical twins. I like that. We're not identical twins. And what that means is we can and should have different views on church. We might have different views on church government. We might have different views on church music. Do we want hymns or do we want modern music? Do we want something in between that's contemporary? There's lots of different ways to do things. 
And there can be differences in terms of the method. Um, we might have different views when it comes to education. Some here are ardent homeschoolers. Some don't homeschool. They don't feel called to that. It's okay for us to be different in that area. Okay? Some have different views on politics. When those politics aren't lined up directly with scripture, we have all sorts of places where we might hold different views. We ought not to put politics up here and our Christianity below it. Our Christianity is here, amen? And we don't want to be conformed to this world. We want to be transformed by the word of God. But that means the word of God will affect our politics. But there are times when there's a non-essential that God's word might not be clear. And you might have two Christians who hold different views politically. That's okay. Let me just say it again. That's okay, right? You don't have to like blister each other on social media like that's ever helped anybody anyway, right? We can have different views on politics. We can have different views on dating, whether it's courtship or dating or whatever. We can have different views on our freedoms like we've been talking about the last few weeks. Some feel free to smoke. Some do not feel free to smoke. The Bible doesn't say that it's a sin. Some feel free to drink. Some do not feel free to drink alcohol. The Bible doesn't say that's a sin. Getting drunk's a sin. Drinking's not a sin. Some feel free to listen to secular music. Some do not feel free to, to listen to secular music. This is an issue of personal freedom and your relationship with God. God will speak to you and God will lead you as to what you are free to do or what you're not free to do when the Bible's not clear or specific. Okay? So we might have differences on freedoms. Listen, we might have differences on the whole issue of what took place last year with COVID. We might have difference on, on how we view vaccination or, or how we view masks. I get that. We can have those differences. Personally, I'm not for vaccinations, but I identify as one who's vaccinated, so I'm trans right? <laughs> So we can have differences on those things, and it's perfectly fine. We don't have to end a friendship over the stuff. Does that make sense? If it's not essential, don't make it essential. So that's one key for us to be unified. We understand that there's some areas where there can be diversity with civility. But listen, unity isn't natural. It isn't easy. But it isn't impossible. It isn't impossible because we have directions in the word of God, meaning God's word tells us how to be unified. Turn over to Colossians 3. Colossians 3, take a look here at verse 12. Colossians 3, verse 12. We have directions right here in the word of God. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of, of perfection, meaning it's the thing that makes you unified. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, in spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So we have directions when it comes to unity. Apply what that says, and we'll be pursuing unity. But we need to remember that one thing it said there was forgiving one another, and of course, having that bond of love. Now, let me say this before we move on. I don't want to put a burden on anyone here who, who might have been abused by someone, whether it was physically, emotionally, or sexually, or whether you have been violated by somebody in your life, or whether you have uh, major hurts where someone has taken advantage of you, and they've hurt you, and they've mistreated you. The word is not telling you to stay in a relationship that's toxic or a relationship that's unhealthy. What it's telling you to do is forgive. So forgive because that's the bond of love. It's not saying to reconcile. There are some times where we cannot reconcile with someone. To suggest that someone who was molested by another person has to reconcile with them is ludicrous. To, to suggest that somehow someone has to reconcile with a person who's toxic and hurts you all the time and is not repentant is ludicrous. The Bible does not say that in any way. So forgiveness is unconditional. Amen? Okay. 
Reconciliation is conditional. The other person has to be a part of the process. And so real quickly, just to show you a difference between the two, forgiveness says, I love you. Agape, right? Agape love, God's love. Reconciliation says, I trust you. Forgiveness says, I hold nothing against you. Reconciliation says, there's nothing between us. See the difference? Again, forgiveness says, I hold nothing against you. Reconciliation says, there's nothing between us. Forgiveness says, I'm good. Reconciliation says, we're good. Forgiveness says, I let it go. And if you do, let it go. Reconciliation says, please don't go. There's a difference between the two. We are called to forgive anyone and everyone, even if they're not sorry, unconditionally but we are not called to reconcile with people who are unrepentant in sin and continue to hurt us and will not acknowledge what we have to say. Amen? Okay, that's important to remember because sometimes people have this weird unity and that's not what we're called to. We're called to a biblical unity. And so, again, unity isn't impossible. We have directions, but we also have power. We have dunamis. We have power from the Lord. Acts 1.8 says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we will have power. And that power is for everything that God calls us to do. And that includes having peace with each other and being like-minded with one another. So why does Jesus pray for unity? Why does Paul pray for unity? Why is unity so important? Here's why. Unity attracts the world. Unity draws people in from the outside. That's why Jesus said that the world may know that we are one. It draws people from the outside. They see so much division. They see so much heartache. So many horrible things happen to each other. They should be able to come in here and find a refuge. They should be able to come in here and see people who don't have it all figured out. But we all know we're messed up and we've been forgiven by God. And so we're loving towards one another. And so unity attracts the world. Secondly, unity glorifies the Lord. It magnifies God when people who are going to spend eternity with each other in heaven act like they're going to spend eternity with each other in heaven because God has done a great work in making us one. He forgave us of our sins, and so it glorifies God. Lastly, it protects the church. Unity protects the church. We're not safe by ourselves. National Geographic had an article on Arctic wolves not that long ago. It described how a seven-member pack of Arctic wolves had targeted a herd of musk oxen. These musk oxen had calves that were very vulnerable. And as soon as the wolves approached to attack, the musk oxen did something that they do by instinct. They made a circle and they put their backsides outward because their hooves are dangerous. And they bound together shoulder to shoulder with all the vulnerable ones in the inside. The wolves, by nature, do what they do. They snarl, they growl, they gnash their teeth, and they wait. They're waiting for a break. They're waiting for all the growling, the snarling of the teeth to affect one musk oxen. And when one musk oxen breaks rank, there's an opening. The writer of the article watched as this took place and the standoff was long. And eventually one of the musk oxen got so afraid, it kept turning back and it took off. When it took off, all of the herd separated into small factions. And eventually they all panicked and they ran away, leaving all the vulnerable calves in the center. The writer watched as the Arctic wolves took their time. Not one calf survived. We have an enemy in Satan. He's real. He hates us. He never has a good day. He never takes a day off. And he's roaring like a lion going to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. He will not go after an area of strength. And when we are shoulder to shoulder with the shield of faith that hooks in together, it's called a phalanx, we're safe. But when there's division, when one breaks rank, when there's factions among us, we're vulnerable. 
God, help us to be like-minded to one another. May God help us to be unified. Would you stand with me?